Okay, folks, would folks who are just walking in please come in and would somebody by the back door please close the doors? We are, it is time to get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as usual, uh, no world slide. I'm not going to go through it, um, but uh, lots of good information there, so uh, pay attention to that. Um, brief agenda. Um, we're going to look at some of the in-situ OEM and proof of transit, um, where we're at with that, um, get some updates. <clears throat> We've got a, a section on uh, looking at the applicability of segment routing to service chaining. Um, some congestion control work that's being done. Uh, some more stuff on the overlay um, OEM. <clears throat> um, Name-based service function forwarding and then some multi-domain SFC with Alto. Um, more detailed agenda here. I'm not going to go through that. Um, in terms of working group progress, um, since ITF 100, uh, we've got the uh, new RFC, which is uh, operating the network service header with Next Protocol None. That's uh, been published. Uh, we've adopted the proof of transit um, document, um, which we'll hear an update on shortly. Um, and also the hierarchical SFC document as well was approved by the IESG um, for publication as an RFC. Um, we still have a lot of work to do in certain areas. I think the main ones from the chair's perspective are some more work on the TLVs. Um, we've had a lot of feedback in terms of um, operators would like to see um, some more use case kind of information on the TLVs and start to define some of those. Um, and then we also have an action on doing some work on security. Are you, are you, Should that say 101? Or, or we not have a meeting at 101? Uh, no, yeah, you're right. There's another typo there, John. It should be 101. Thank you. And Jim, the other thing that we might want to mention is that we also adopted the uh, NSH, IOM, and CAP draft. Yes. Yeah, not only you, the proof of transit draft. 
so yeah, that is fairly incomplete. Um, anything you want to say? Okay, so uh, we'll dive straight into it. So, uh, Frank, please. Uh, slides, please. <laughs> There you are. Okay, so really briefly, um, because there's been no real document updates uh, above and beyond the adoption of, I think there, I can't really use a clicker because it's a single slide. Speak closer to the microphone. Oh, I need to go eat it, okay. Um, so we adopted uh, the IOM NSH draft um, after the last Wigging Group meeting, um, there's not really been any updates from a content perspective other than editorial changes to that particular draft. It's relatively sweet and short because, um, well, we're just using the next header approach as we had the discussion in the last meeting to go and slot in uh, the IOEM data information. And um, what we can do from an editorial cleanup perspective in the next step and I think that's, let me go and ask that question one more time because we had the discussion in the last meeting. We're right now, we're discussing in the draft the two potential NCAP approaches for NSH. One is the next header approach, which is more hardware friendly because we're doing less TLV nesting. Uh, the other one would be to use ML, uh, <clears throat> metadata type two, um, which is less efficient and turns well, we went for the more efficient approach within the current draft. There is a little bit of a discussion in there under the consideration section in section four. Um, we could go and clean that section up and just say, well, let us the agreed approach go forward uh, so that we are not really presenting all these options on par. It's something that we can go do. Uh, let me know what people feel. We can also keep it the way it is right now. Any thoughts? If not immediate, just send it to the list. Um, other than that, well, as I said, the document is very simple. Hence, um, I don't expect that we need to go and go through a load of iterations. So if it's stable, maybe we can even go to working group last call in the next meeting. Um, let's get to the, the more fun thing, which is proof of transit. Um, Joel, if you just fast forward to the next quote unquote presentation, which is another single slide because uh, I'm just preparing the stage for Diego. Uh, so the other document, as Jim was saying earlier on, that we adopted is the SFC proof of transit draft. And again, there's been no content changes other than editorial. And um, as we all remember, that particular draft offers two distinct algorithmic approaches to solving the problem. One is based on Shamir secret sharing, which in the current version in the draft does not offer the, the option to preserve the order or check the order that a particular chain has been traversed in order. So you can check that the particular set of nodes has been visited, but not whether they have been uh, visited in a particular order. The other approach, which uses nested encryption, has that particular capability at the expense that you're using nested encryption, which typically is more compute intense or you require specific hardware that will do that. And we already had the discussion in the last meeting and even prior, can't we just, rather than have two, it's always preferable to have one approach that everybody would agree with so that we're not ending up with multiple implementations, multiple options, which is time consuming, um, expensive and the likes. And um, well, so far we didn't really have that. 
But um, thanks to the work of Diego and team, there is a proposal now that we can go and use Shamir, Shamir's secret sharing and on top of that, have an incremental addition uh, to allow us to use Shamir's secret sharing with order preservation with some additional fairly interesting tweak uh, that these guys came up with. And so um, I'm much in favor to eventually consolidate the two mechanisms into one where we have one base algorithm and then if you need order preservation you can do that additional tweak uh, that Diego is going to go talk about in a middle minute on top. So maybe we can just pause here, have Diego present and then come back to that particular discussion as part of Diego's session because that would mean we can go and clean up the document, streamline it quite a bit with these additions. Diego, why don't you just Swing by. Okay, so since uh, Frank's uh, nice introduction, I think that everything, almost everything is said, but anyway, just for you to, uh, to have an idea, it's, um, it's a basic proposal that uh, we uh, <coughs> started work, uh, working some time ago and that we <clears throat> share with uh, his team, then with the shares, then with all of you, just to, to have an idea. Basically, it is to support uh, that the uh, pot is ordered, which is, we believe, is a strong requirement in, in many cases, and this is something that is, well, has been acknowledged in the document right now. The, uh, our main concern was to make this com fully compatible with, uh, with the current proposal, so we are not going to force the choice of a different algorithm or to make it much more computationally intensive or to affect the way in which operations are, are considered right now by a, by a, a controller uh, entity that is um, distributing um, uh, crypt material. So we have tried precisely because of this to build this as, a, as an extension. So the idea is that uh, in principle, looking at how uh, what we propose, we should be able to make it uh, the use of ordered pot or an ordered pot part of a of a level of assurance that uh, and the operator of the network wants to uh, keep on the uh, on the deployment. Uh, and well, it's uh, something that comes uh, came to our minds when thinking about that is that, for example. If we uh, manage to, to build this and to have uh, the uh, um, order report, something that can be achieved as well to some extent is uh, precisely at the station of the topology. You can verify the certain properties about the topology that the packets, since the packets are following a particular path in the network and you can verify that, you can imply that there are some, uh, you can attest to some extent that the topology that you intended to have is, a, is in, in force. So basically, the method what you have uh, in the uh, upper part is essentially what is right now in the pod uh, draft. The idea is that uh, at each link between two, uh, every two nodes, we are uh, we are exchange uh, the CML and the random value, and at the end, the verifier what the verifier does is to verify that the uh, uh, CML that it has rece uh, received is equal to this to the um, addition of the secret it has plus the random value, basically. So you are, well, I teach hope the, uh, each node is adding to the, uh, um, uh, to the, uh, at the header of the packet, the combination of uh, the, uh, the, uh, poly the combination of the results of the calculations of the polyne polynomial uh, coefficients it has plus the random value that was originally uh, inserted by the, uh, the ingress point. Simply what we propose is that at the same time that we are, you are this, uh, the controller is distributing these uh, polynomial coefficients to the different nodes, it provides adi additionally what we call a mask. And that mask is used to, uh, is used to uh, f uh, th that mask is assigned to each link, not to each node, to each link connecting two nodes. And whenever one node is receiving um, a packet, it uses the ingress ma mask at this node uh, to uh, uh, put in clear the uh, the coefficient, uh, the, uh, the polynomial value plus the random value, make the calculations, and before sending it uh, downstream, 
it uses the uh, egress mask to build the, uh, to build the, uh, the value that is in the, be sending out. That way, whatever, uh, when at the end of the, uh, <clears throat> of the chain or at the end of the path, the uh, verifier makes a, uh, performs the verification, it performs exactly the same verification. There is no change on the, on the computations that are uh, made at each node. It can verify that if the uh, equality holds is because the other uh, of the links have been has been the, uh, the intended because otherwise the um, uh, the application of the link mask would have failed and the and the uh, values of the CML at any at, at each point and the random value would have been altered. We call it a mask. Originally we started calling it a key, but we decided to call it a mask because we wanted to remark the fact that these are a very simple computational. Uh, a computationally simple mechanism. What we are proposing in the current text we have is uh, to use XOR. Some others I have seen, for example, a proposal that uh, Jack Ofstein has uh, shared with me of an idea he was, he was thinking about about using a product. A product uh, mod, uh, modulus the, uh, the the prime. There are other potential operations. The idea, the basic idea, is to have this operation computationally simple. And let me insist, is that all calculations at all nodes and, and, the, and the final verification are kept without any change. Well, next steps. Uh, our idea is to incorporate this, this change in the, um, the uh, POP draft. Um, likely as a, the new version of se section, the current section 3.5 that is about other pot. And uh, for sure that we need to, to update the uh, security considerations because uh, if you start playing with this, you need additional thing about how you uh, manage the masks, about uh, which is the most adequate uh, masking operation. Uh, well, making why not XOR as a, as a mask, for example. And ideas about uh, there are some discussions about rerouting that probably would need to, to be um, updated. Whatever other thing that you can think of would be extremely welcome, and whatever the uh, the, the enhancement. Uh, that's all. Yes. Yeah, Frank Rockner. One, maybe just comment or addition. Um, Diego, you always mentioned link. Um, in essence, that doesn't necessarily need to be a link between the individual yeah. nodes. It's just the association of node n to n plus one, right? Because yeah. what eff effectively happens is what we didn't have so far is an association of node n and oh, node n plus one. What you're doing is at node n, you're distorting CML so that only the node n plus one who can reverse the distortion mm -hmm. in a symmetric operation can make sense out of CML. Exactly. Yep. That's exactly, so you're just providing a means to go and associate these two elements with each other uh, so there is no necessity of a link or anything between that. It just means, well, no. something it's an that overlay, takes the packet it, from the It's an overlay editor. link. It's yeah. an overlay link. It's a thing. virtual link. Whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. It doesn't a, necessarily even need to be an overlay link, right? It can be multiple hops in between because if you're only very oh, yeah, no, that's that what an overlay link is. One, and you have we have a transport mechanism that will transport the packet from Correct. one SFF no. to another, no. and this binds the two ends of that together mm. cryptographically based on the the, all the polynomial work. Yeah, no, I just for, want to go and underline that fact. No, for, it's for, it's more agree. generic than, than... Yeah, yeah, fully, fully agree. Something that we have to be careful about the word and just to be sure that is uh, well understood. Yeah. Okay. Ju? <laughs> so can, can we get maybe a sense in the room whether people like that approach and whether we should go and really consider, I think there's two things that we can go do. Um, we can first of all obviously fold that into the draft and then carry on with the two options that we have. Maybe that's the first interim step. And then mm -hmm. on top of that, in the next meeting, decide whether we really yeah. want to go and... We don't even have to wait for the next meeting. It's probably sensible to just put it in the draft as a first step so that we trace the breadcrumbs. But as soon as you've done that, I think we can reasonably ask the working group, can we now make this the only option for addressing that problem? Okay. We don't need to wait for the ne for November in okay. Bangkok. So let's swing it in, have okay. a new revision out, and we then on top of that, we can go and see whether people have a feeling towards one or the other, whether we really want to go in with one option, which would be my preference, 
and then maybe we have another revision and can go and settle yeah. the overall argument in the next meeting. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. I wasn't sure who was presenting. Okay, there's your clicker. Thanks. So I'm Francois Clad from Cisco, and I'm presenting this draft on on behalf of my co-authors. And as a disclaimer, we are fully aware that this working group is chartered to work on, on NSH, and this is obviously not NSH. Um, but this is still service training, and you work on service training, so we thought that it might be interesting for you to, um, to hear about this proposal, and maybe you can, you can provide us some feedback. And also, this is not a comparison between NSH and segment routing. And I'm not going to argue about which one is the best for service training. I believe that both proposals, both um, architectures have their values and they just have different use cases, in my opinion. Anyway, so the context, this draft is based on um, on two other drafts that have been around from, for some time now. And these are the segment routing architecture drafts. They both mentioned that a segment can be associated to any type of um, instructions that can be topological or service-based. And while the topological instructions have been quite studied and they are well-defined and well understood now, there have been there has been little work on the service instructions. So this draft is basically about how to associate a service to a segment and how that integrates within the larger segment routing architecture. So essentially, a service segment is just another type of segment and it inherits most of the characteristics of other segment types. It is stateless in the fabrics, meaning that all the state is actually in the packet itself. It also seamlessly integrates with other types of segment, meaning that you can combine the service segment with VPN and traffic engineering segments within the same segment list, within the same header. The service itself is also opaque to the head end and the intermediate nodes. And what does that mean? That means that what the head end and all the nodes actually see is a segment. And they only have to know how to forward the packet based on this segment. They don't need to know what is the actual service associated to the segment. That is a local knowledge of the node that instantiates the segment and the controller or the entity that computes the path and builds the seed list. These service segments can be SR, uh, for SRMPLS and for SRV6. For SRMPLS, the service seed is simply an MPLS label, like any other seed. And it is allocated on an MPLS router that will receive the packet, pop the label, and then either transmit the packet to the service with the label stack still on top of it, if the, the service is MPLS capable, or it will apply a proxy function and first remove the MPLS label stack before sending the packet to the, to the service, and then reapply the label stack when the packet comes back. Uh, that, that, uh, sorry. Um, okay. That seed um, can be either taken from the global block or the local label block. That really depends on the uh, depend on the use case. If it's taken from the global block, then the service seed can be reachable from any node in the MPLS domain. If it's local, then you need a previous segment that will steer the traffic up to the, the node where the local segment is instantiated. But 
that is the same for any other type of segments. For a service six, it is essentially the same. Um, the difference, of course, is that we use a service six seed, which are represented as IPv6 addresses instead of MPLS labels. And another difference is that the seed can also be, in some cases, uh, instantiated on the service itself. So the service will receive the packet and do the segment routing processing, process the, the payload, and then forward the packet to the next segment. Then in terms of metadata, there are several ways to, to carry the metadata. And it, it really depends what kind of metadata we're talking about. If we're talking about a, simply a tenant ID, then we can use the VPN segment. And that is an MPLS label or an SRVCC that is at the end of the segment list and identifies the tenant. If we need to do some group-based policy type of, uh, if we need some group-based policy type of metadata, then the segment routing header tag field would be the place to put that information. And for other types of metadata that could not be represented as a segment or would not fit in the tag field, we have in the segment routing header TLVs that we can use for, for carrying metadata. And in this TLV, one of the TLV is actually reusing the, the, the TLV defined for, for NSH. So we are not trying to kind of reinvent the wheel. Um, in conclusion, what this, graph, what this graph describes is a way to bound a service to a seed. And it completely integrates within the segment routing architecture as it is defined in, in other drafts. It is not a new architecture that we define just for service training. And as you've noticed, it is not the SFC architecture either. But the reason why we did not try to combine the SFC and the segment routing architecture is that we believe that this will add complexity while maybe we don't need that additional complexity and we can just do it with, with segment routing, at least for some use cases. So that's all for, the, for this presentation. If you have any question or feedback, uh, that would be helpful. We have okay. somebody on me. So Greg joined the queue. That was just Greg joining the queue because he's presenting later. It's not a question. Okay. Oh, no, it's a question. Oh, There's a question. Please. OK, thank you. Um, uh, I raised this question uh, in MPLS working group meeting. Uh, so by uh, combining uh, transport and service in MPLS uh, encapsulation, how you uh, see that uh, separation of OEM, how you can distinguish between the problem in the transport and monitor the transport and monitor the service uh, if everything is uh, encoded as MPLS labels? I think that we, look at it differently. Uh, we look at it from a segment routing policy perspective. And when we try to do OAM, uh, we will analyze the policy and each segment of the policy, whether that is a topological segment or a service segment. Mm, I don't understand what you mean by analyze from policy perspective. So you know that uh, OEM is not only a function of control plane. Uh, many OEM functions that are residing for efficiency in a, a data plane. Are you saying that this notion will be propagated in a, a transport layer? Hi, uh, this is Manchu from Siena. Yeah. 
Uh, I, I just wanted to respond to Greg's, uh, or maybe ask for a better clarification on what he's asking. So as far as I know, and, and you know, uh, as far as this draft is concerned, you have a set of SID list. Some of them represents the services. So it's in terms of doing an OAM at different planes, uh, whether it is for the transport or whether it is for the service, it is all a matter of what SID list you are including for that OAM package. If you have the service label and you have an OAM, then it goes for the service OAM. If you have uh, only the transport SID list, then it goes for the transport OAM. I don't see specifically any issue with keeping them uh, as a problem space. Well, so I don't want to get too much, but the obvious issue that has been raised in the past with OAM is that you may well not want OAM packets to be sent through your services. You want to use the same service chaining, but since most applications don't really know what to do with OAM packets, because they're applications with a job to do, it is helpful to be able to tell, oh, this is an OAM packet and that's the link to the service, so I can not do that or do something different over it, yep. and that's harder if everything's just a label. Now, that doesn't mean you can't make it yep. work. It just means there seem to be some complexities that I think Greg is asking about. Yeah, yes. yeah, there, there, Thank there you. We but, but so how is the service OAM work if the service is only doing the service aspect of it, irrespective of whether it is done by the labels or by the NSH header? Right. Uh, Himanshu, uh, actually, that's that was my question. So I'm just I'm not saying that there, there is a problem. I'm pointing that it becomes uh, problematic and requires uh, very delicate attention. Correct. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, this is new topic, so something needs to be explored. Yeah, th this OEM aspect will require some work, and it may be it. Yeah, most probably it's more difficult with SRM PLS than SRV6. Um, but for SRV6, what we have defined is an OAM bit in the segment treating header that allows us to identify OAM packets. And for the service segments, we would skip the service processing when we see a packet with the OAM bit set. And we would do some, some other processing instead, some OAM related processing instead. One one more comment, and I want to preempt one. He's what, what he's coming <laughs> here for. So I think the point he's going to make I, that that train has left the station because there are any uh, other drafts which where the the service uh, the MPLS labels are being used or the labels themselves are used as a service identifier. There are two other drafts actually yeah. that talk about this, and this is the third one in the service chain. So. I know your you last know comment was say. that if it is simple. I, <laughs> no, I, I, I think, and, and Greg's comment, Andrew Dolgan on Nokia, uh, and Greg, Greg's comment points to the stuff. Fundamentally, we trade off here uh, for simplicity of implementation, we trade off some of the functionality of a, you know, a isolated NSH based service uh, implementation. And I think it would be beneficial for everybody if we start putting into the draft certain acknowledgement of those uh, trade-offs uh, because there are things that we, like, tra like trade-offs, there is nothing for free. So some things will not be possible and it will be very, it should be very obvious as uh, to the reader of the draft what's possible, what's not. Yep. And those are good, you know, in many cases, this will be a good uh, trade-off to do. In other cases, it may not, uh, and uh, will make certain problems out of scope because we just admit those are the limitations. And I think uh, that's what we need to make it clear. We need to make it clear that this is a trade-off of simplicity versus flexibility of an SH, because we do tie it back to transport, which not necessarily is desired in some cases. Yeah, there is definitely trade-offs, and we can clarify that in the draft. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Tal, since I should not be moderating something I'm co-author on, please come up. 
and Jim will be presenting. Yeah, I get to present. Let's start you at the front of the deck. No, that's the previous deck. Sorry. Thanks, Joel. So, um, so I wanted to give you a brief update um, on a draft that uh, that myself and uh, some co-authors on here put together. Um, we recognise the fact that there was some confusion over um, segment routing doing service chaining and NSH doing service chaining, and what we really wanted to convey was that these are complementary technologies, not competing technologies. Um, so this is really the purpose of this draft to show that segment routing and NSH can actually work very well together. Um, and if you combine the two things, then um, hopefully you have something that's actually deployable now as opposed to having to wait for, let's say, an SRV6 implementation that may be some time off before we could actually deploy it. Um, I presented this in the spring working group, tough crowd, I might add. Um, but, uh, um, and I think we'll probably uh, try to push this one through the spring working group um, because I think the extensions that are required are kind of more related to segment routing than they are to, uh, to what we do here with the NSH. Um, so the basic intention of the draft, um, we described two application scenarios. There are more than two, but I think these two really highlight the uh, uh, the applicability um, of where the network service header and segment routing can be deployed together to support the SFC use cases in a, in a manner that's efficient, um, but also maintains the separation of the service and the transport planes, which was the original intention of the SFC architecture um, that we documented in RC 7665. So scenario one looks at simply using segment routing as the transport uh, technology between SFFs and NSH is carried beneath segment routing uh, to do the service chain in piece. And then the second scenario looks at um, integrating the NSH with segment routing uh, whereby we actually use the segment list of um, very similar to what Francois has, uh, uh, talked about in his draft, um, but instead of using a, a service SID, um, the SID basically says, oh, there's NSH that follows, I need to pop the, the segment routing stack, and I'm going to use NSH in the service plane. And I, I'll show you some pictures. So this is scenario one. Um, the obvious uh, and the one that we documented in the draft is the obvious one where you might have a couple of data centers where you're using the NSH encapsulation with VXLAN or whatever it may be. Um, and you want to be able to extend the service chain between data centers across the metro. Um, this is just an example. There are plenty of other examples, but it, it highlights the point. And then across the metro, maybe you want to do some kind of traffic steering to get the uh, um, the requirements that you need in the uh, in the forwarding. Uh, so this simply is just carrying NSH underneath the transport. The transport happens to be segment routing rather than GRE or IPsec or any of the other uh, transport encapsulations that are available to us. Pretty straightforward, I think. Uh, um, if you read the draft, it's it, it's reasonably clear. Um, in the draft, what we tried to do was state the benefits of, one, of, of, of these particular uh, scenarios. In this particular one, um, we felt that this gives us the ability or the, the network operator the ability to take advantage of the transport independent nature of the NSH encapsulation um, and also take advantage of the capabilities of segment routing for the traffic steering. Um, the other nice thing about this is that we can avoid perhaps some of the more complex uh, hierarchical SFC uh, scenarios. We have an RFC or will have an RFC on that very shortly, but um, it's <clears throat> more complex and, and we can do some of the things that, you, that we describe in that draft using this mechanism in a, in a less complex way. There's clear responsibility division between NSH and segment routing, in other words, the service plane and the transport. 
Um, and it's basically applicable to any any case where you've got multiple segments of a chain that are distributed across multiple domains in the network. The second scenario that we describe is uh, the integration of the service of, of NSH with uh, segment routing. Um, as you see in this picture, basically you you uh, you again carry NSH underneath segment routing. But in this case, when you get to a forwarder, the SID basically says, "Oh, this this is a service SID, so I'm going to strip off the segment routing stack. I'm going to send the packet, uh, the rest of the packet to the service. That that packet has NSH on it, and therefore when it comes back." I can use the path identifier in the NSH header to uh, figure out which particular segment stack do I need to push back onto this packet. Now, the clear advantage of this is that it gets rid of all of the complexity of having to have VLANs between the services and the, and the SFFs. Um, the NSH path identification gives you a very nice way of, uh, of, of removing all of that complexity. And the other, obviously, uh, these are the stated benefits. I, I'm not going to bore you all with this. You can read the draft. But it just goes through what we see as some of the stated benefits of that second scenario. Um, encapsulation details are in the draft. I'm not going to bother going through this. But it's simply we carry uh, NSH under the segment routing stack, um, whether it be SRMPLS under the label stack or whether it be uh, SRV6 under the IPv6 encapsulation. So conclusions, um, the purpose of the draft is really to show that the, the two technologies are complementary. It's not to try and say NSH is much better than segment routing or segment routing is much better than NSH. We don't care. It's just these two things can be used in combination. If you want to use one or the other, that's fine. Um, but if you want to combine these two things, that's fine too. Um, the other reason for this was that the SR-based SFC has several options, um, each of which has pros and cons. Again, I'm not going to go into all of those. I'd be happy to have a conversation with anybody that wants to have that conversation. It's very clear on, an, um, on SR MPLS, there's a lot of things that it simply cannot do, um, especially in the metadata uh, fields. And with SRV6, um, you know, the main issue there is the length of time we have to wait to actually get something that we can deploy. Um, so, in conclusion, we you know the draft basically says that this kind of solution uh, keeps the merits of both NSH and segment routing, and therefore is attractive. So, in terms of next steps, we want to get feedback on the draft, but from both Spring and SFC working groups for obvious reasons, um, but. Assuming that we get um, some support within the community, then we'll probably ask for adoption within the spring working group um, so that, um, you know, these segment routing type solutions get pushed through in the, uh, so there's not kind of competing between SFC and spring. I'd rather keep it in one place. So happy uh, to take any questions. Looks like we have Greg on the queue. Oh, sorry. Uh, it was unintentional. Oh, okay. Any other questions or comments? Garb Dabra, LinkedIn. I have a question on that slide which you had about uh, the stripping of the SR header. Uh, which slide, sorry? This one. This one. So you're defining a new behavior uh, by stripping the SR header when you send it to the service and then it comes back. So it's on a standard track or informational? The the the, uh, the documents and the informational. Okay, so but there is no behavior on SFF one, right? The well, the only behavior is that, um, and, and this is something we'd have to discuss, I guess, through the mailing list. But the the behavior required is that you need to when you receive the NSH packet back from the service, it needs to understand for that particular path identifier, it's not going to do a lookup on the NSH and, and, and the, uh, the path ID and the index to do the forwarding. It's simply going to look at that path and say, ah, this needs to have a segment routing stack pushed onto the packet and forwarded based on the segment routing stack. So there is, a, there, there is, a, there is a, uh, an implication there um, that we need to certainly talk through. 
So in any environment, you have either some kind of transport which is already set, whether it's MPLS or IP or something, right? Um, I'm trying to figure out in which scenarios we would have a situation where you have NSH deployed, right? But the but the transport is constant, yeah. And you also need segment routing for traffic engineering, yeah. Um, which is a scenario where we need two headers, right? An NSH header and a segment routing header. It's not clear to me just by. Oh, okay, so. This picture would basically shows it. So in this case, where you're wanting to do segment routing between data centers, for example, to maintain some kind of SLA. In this case, what you're doing is you're carrying NSH under the segment routing because the other data center wants to continue the chain in the data center itself. So in this picture, you've got a service chain where you've got service one in data center one, and then service two is in another data center. Um, so in this case, you need to maintain the NSH encapsulation between those two points, but maybe, and, and frankly, this is a made up picture, but maybe you want to do some kind of traffic steering across the metro. I mean, this picture makes sense, right? This is, this is fine. Um, what I'm trying to understand, because you started this presentation saying there are scenarios where it could be a different kind of transports. Yes. Right. In this situation, you have a transport which says MPL in the MPLS in the data center, or or maybe IP in the data center, MPLS between the data centers, and you have IP again in the data center. The yeah. transports are constant. I already have a segment routing, which is there, which is doing a traffic engineering with my inter DC traffic, and within the DC, maybe in brownfield migrations, you all where you already have NSH, this may make sense, but in any migration where you're bringing in traffic engineering, we're bringing in new service chaining. Yeah. Um, it may be beneficial to just use one header then. Yeah, and, and all I'm, I, it maybe would have been easier in this picture in the red transport if I'd have said VXLAN. That would have been the simplest way to put it. Um, so okay. I could change that picture. So what we're really saying is in the data centers in this case where there is no segment routing at this point, that's not to say there might not be in the future. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Some maybe, some maybe not. In this case, I don't have any segment routing capability in these data centers. They're simply VXLAN. So in this case, if I want to extend chain in between them, then this is when I would combine the two things. Okay. Yep. So this, okay, we should talk offline. Um, yeah. I have a few other questions. Thanks. Yeah. Actually, can. um, Kent Leong, um, actually, I want to, I mean, I think, I think this is a good example, actually, of where you have different types of transport domains, right? It could be MPLS or NHA, uh, VXLAN, IPv4, right? I mean, like I said, I think this is a hypothetical example, but this kind of justify why we're having the two layers being split, yeah. right? So, so of course, I think this approach is very favorable to NSH and by being able to maintain that, right? So, yeah. so I think it's a good idea. Thank you. Uh, with Hendrix Nokia, uh, one of the co-authors also from the previous uh, thing. I believe, yes, yeah, so there is a need, I think, for, I, we call this a, a decoupled model, so where service and transport are decoupled, whereas the previous presentation is more you have service and transport uh, coupled. I wanted to, I, the reason I came here is on the mic was mainly because of the standardization track, because there is some forwarding behavior on the, I bought egress from uh, segment routing to the NI, to the, from between the SFF and the SF, and the other direction, which is specific to this NSH forwarding, which yeah. is similar to Andy's uh, yep. uh, drafts, which he will present in a bit. And as such, we might have to do standards. Track. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So because the, the prefix SIT or whatever we want to call it uh, is going to determine certain lookups and certain forwarding behaviors to, between the SFF and the SF that will be specific for this uh, use case, uh, for this, let's say, yeah. environment. So yeah. as such, I think we ha we might have to change from informational to standard track. Okay. Yep. Hey, Jim. Um, uh, Rajiv Asari. So... There's a merit, of course, in, in having to have both SR and NSH coexist. Um, but the, the perceived challenge would be the SFF1, as an example, um, which instead of having to deal with uh, NSH table lookup independently, an SR table lookup, now we may have to interchange them. So I do an NSH lookup, I got to get an SR uh, outgoing SID list, or vice versa. 
that means more state that gets created, which is a lot more intricate and, and uh, related than, than it should be. So perhaps one thought process that you could consider to really carry the, the SR stack, which is incoming in maybe the, the metadata, which when it comes back, SFF doesn't need to do a lookup in NSH. It just does the lookup in that metadata. Use that to do a lookup back in the SR. So from the forwarding lookup point of view, nothing really changes. Yep. Yeah, it's another option. I, I, I mean, I'm, I, I should say, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not one of the people that buys this argument about state. I think it's a bogus argument, frankly. And but, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't see an issue with the amount of state. And and if I did, I wouldn't be advocating NSH because there is state. The question is, is that actually a problem? Uh, I don't think so, but you know, I, uh, maybe smarter minds than me think that, uh, that there is, but, but you're right. I mean, there are various ways we could do it. This is just one, one way that we've, you know, chosen to document it. And, and the purpose, as I said, was initially was to show that these two things are complementary. Uh, it's not state, but necessarily the relatively simpler approach. Is, is what we ought to be thinking. Yeah, and there are, there there are some there, there are some potential. Uh, I'm still talking with the other authors, but there are uh, some potential things that we might add. We're still in discussion um, because there are some other mechanisms that you could use um, that have pros and drawbacks. Of course. So we'll we'll put it in the draft for a, for a, for a next spin. Sure. Thanks. Yep. So we're going to cut the lines, the current people who are current, currently in the line. <laughs> just a quick comment. I, I was just going to iterate the same point which the previous gentleman was saying, that yes, there is a forwarding behavior change here, right? Especially yep. the lookups, which has been iterated a couple of times. So if we document that, then it has to go into the standard track. Yeah, I think, uh, I think so too. Yep. Yeah, and, and then we should discuss because there's other intricacies here which is not being considered, especially for uh, large-scale MSTCs. Yeah, and, and, and to be fair, um, there's a couple of details from the forwarding perspective that actually Wim and I talked about this week that we need, and we're going to actually add something to the draft for a next spin because it, it's a little bit more complicated than perhaps I <laughs> suggested. Yes. Yeah, yeah, at first, and that's yes. okay. You know, we got to start slowly, so we'll we'll put that in there for the next revision. Kent Leung, um, I actually want to say this earlier. I forgot. <laughs> um, actually, I thought the other thing that wasn't mentioned here was the OAM aspect, right? Actually, in some ways, this links in very well with existing SFC OAM, right? So yes. that was brought up earlier as far how do OAM for SR6 and um, yes. PLS, for example, type of stuff, right? So so I think this actually naturally fits well. So just in our, in our good example, probably to fit in the draft as well. Yep, thank you. Andrew Dolgana, Rokia, so yes, standards for sure. This picture exactly shows the advantage of, of NSH separated from the segment routing, so we should focus on that. Uh, quite a bit, uh, shows flexibility that the other will not give us, but will give us simpler implementation and OEM, uh, yeah, it will work. So uh, last comment, I hope we're gonna progress both of those in the same forum. Yeah. Uh, because it, 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 will, it will help both solutions. Thanks, Andrew. Okay, thank you. Oh, unless, uh, oh, you're coming up, Andy. Hi, I'm Andy Malice. Um, this is a draft that um, are presented earlier in the week in the MPLS working group. And uh, we expect that the work will primarily be done in the MPLS working group. I'm just presenting it here for the information of the SFC working group. Um, I don't expect to be presenting it here again, but we will be uh, keeping the SFC working group um, appraised of the progress and you know we'll, we'll copy all the major stuff to both MPLS and SFC lists as it comes up. So the basic intention of the draft is to define an encapsulation that's used to transport SFC packets that use the network service header from one SSF to the next SSF over, the, over an MPLS infrastructure. So the picture you see here is from RSC 7665 SSC architecture, and we've just added a, some color 
So the red nodes are MPLS enabled LSRs um, that in, that include SF, SFFs in them. Um, so it shows a path from a source to a destination, uh, from SSF to SSF as usual, with service functions. And the only uh, thing that's interesting here is that the SFFs are all part of an MPLS infrastructure. So this is the encapsulation details um, in order to carry the network service header over MPLS. And it's, it's um, actually, very simple. In green, you see the NSH header and payload, um, exactly as, as defined um, by RC8300. And then on top of that, we put a label uh, for the SFF label, and then we have transport labels over that. And this looks very simple, very, very similar to an MPLS VPN label. Um, and the SSF label identifies a particular SFF instance at the downstream LSR or receiving node. This allows you to have more than one SFF instance at the downstream LSR. Um, the SSF labels are advertised by the downstream LSR to an upstream LSR, uh, which is an SFF, so that's the sending SFF. It uses standard MPLS label um, advertisement in the control plane. Um, and that control plane could include LDP or RSVP or Yang, BGP, PSAP. Um, and I have a later slide that, that goes into this, but it's basically standard MPLS. Uh, and because there can be multiple transport labels um, above the SSF um, label, this works with MPLS-based segment routing as well, SRM PLS. And in particular, it, it works with the draft that Jim just presented as well. Uh, we expect the primary usage would be scenario one, but there's no reason why it couldn't work with scenario two as well. Um, there are some ECMP considerations that, um, that come up whenever you send anything through an MPLS infrastructure um, because e e ECMP forwarding through an MPLS infrastructure may or may not be desirable for a particular SSE flow. And that really is um, a decision to be made on a flow by flow basis. You know, some flows will require in order delivery and others not. And so ECMP may be desirable for some and not for others. Um, as we know, the NSH was carefully constructed so that the first nibble of the NSH provides protection to prevent unintended ECMP by never being equal to either four or six. Um, if ECMP is desired, MPLS does have uh, two native mechanisms that are available to provide entropy. One is the entropy label and the other is the flow aware transport label and the co-authors are still talking amongst ourselves as to making a recommendation between one or the other. We don't, do not yet have one. There are also OAM considerations. Greg, if you're listening, this slide is for you. Um, OAM at the SSC layer is handled by SSC design, defined mechanisms as uh, described in 8300. And OAM may also be required at the MPLS layer. And if you need an OAM at the MPLS layer, well, we have MPLS defined OAM mechanisms as well, such as GAL. And that's just one example. Um, I've been asked to compare this draft with two other particular drafts. So the first of the two is a similarly named but extremely different draft that's already a working group draft in the MPLS working group, draft IETF MPLS SFC. Uh, so the, the draft I'm talking about right here uh, for the SSC encapsulation transports SSC packets with the network service header between SSFs over an MPLS infrastructure. And it supports all SFC and features, and most importantly, it supports per packet metadata because we have the NSH header. However, um, draft IETF MPLS SFC does not use the NSH header. Rather, it uses the MPLS label stack to logically represent the NSH um, for interim deployments in an MPLS infrastructure that does not support the NSH at all. So there's no NSH in packets. There's no per packet 
metadata. Um, there is the possibility of doing per flow metadata, and that requires either control plan extensions or a new MPLS special purpose label that is defined in that draft. And it also encodes the SSC service path indicator and service index as labels, which I put in quotes in the label stack. And the reason I put those in quotes is that they require processing different from standard MPLS labels. I've also been asked to compare this with draft shoe clad, which we heard two drafts ago. Um, and so, as I said before, my draft transports FCC packets with the NSH between SSFs, supports both traditional label swapping and SRM PLS. When you use label swapping, there's all the usual MPLS stuff, including state, such as the lib, in every LSR along the way. And it's really intended for SSC infrastructures uh, where the uh, SSC NSH is present in every packet. Draft shoe clad, rather, is intended to support a more generalized service programming in domains. Um, services are, are supported with, associated with SIDS, as we saw. It's, it's, um, that draft is somewhat more general than SSC, in that services could be more than just service functions, as we define here in this working group. Um, it works with both SRM PLS and SRV6. It does, some, it does not support MPLS label swapping, so that's one difference there because there's no MPLS state in the routers for that draft. And the NSH is available using a TLV, the NSH carrier TLV, if you do want to use draft shoe cloud with standard SSC um, defined SFs. So the next steps for this draft are to progress the four future study items. Uh, right now, those are the ECMP recommendation and work on the control plane. And since I wrote this draft, we've actually had more progress on the control plane. Um, the authors of this draft have sat down with the authors of draft IETF best NSA BGP control plane, and we've actually determined that there's already the mechanisms that we need in that draft to support our draft here. Um, and we may have other control options going, a few, going forward as well, but certainly the best draft for the BGP control plan is one that we've heard um, a lot of, of interest about. And we'll be working towards adoption, as I said before, in the MPLS working group. So I see at least one, com no, one comment or a question. I'm the job scribe, right? So uh, there's a comment from Gregory Miski. Yes. Uh, it's either about slide four or five. It says RFC. It says 83,000. So 8,300. No, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> probably a typo, but he didn't correct. Um, so it's, uh, it says that RFC 8,300 does not define any OEA, OAM. It defines an OAM bit. Okay, so th th that's what I'm referring to. It defines the OAM bit in the NSH header, which will then be used by the actual OAM mechanisms. So th th that's what I was referring to right there. Justin, sir, so you're expecting the service label to be the bottom of stack label, right? Yes. So it probably would be good to clarify, I also said that boss should be signaling that this is a... Yes. Um, well, actually, there, there are some uh, particular possibilities just with other service labels, like VPN labels, where it may not be exactly at the bottom of the stack. Um, there are, for example, if, if we're using ELELI, there's a possibility that ELELI could end up underneath it. Um, but, you know, that's something that we have to look forward to. In general, it yeah. would make lookup easier because you just fetch your label stack, you scan to the boss, and then you look up on the stage. Yes. Just exactly. to put it in drop. So Absolutely. We'll get more on OAM in two presentations, so we can yep. then discuss any related issues. Okay, any other questions or comments? Well, thank you very much. Donald?
So I'm Donald Eastlake with uh, Huawei. I'm going to talk about the explicit congestion notification and congestion feedback uh, using the network service header and IP fix. So the, the goal is to be able to collect congestion information within a service function chaining domain, a long pass through that domain, uh, without having to do that by detecting dropped packets, uh, except in the extreme cases, and to communicate congestion information back to the classifier or the ingress so that it can take uh, action to reduce congestion. So uh, it's communicated downstream through use of explicit congestion notification, which is uh, defined for IP in 3168, typically uses two bits. We use the same sort of thing with those two bits, but bits in the network service header. And connection communication is communicated, information is communicated back uh, using IP fix, uh, which is defined in RFC 7011. There's a graph that extends it for this purpose. So here's kind of a diagram of what's going on. We have an original sender and a final receiver, and somewhere along that path, there's this SFC domain with uh, ingress and egress and classifier, and uh, SFFs and SFs. This is a somewhat simplified diagram, obviously. It could have proxies, it could have other things. And uh, what you want to do is measure congestion across that. Uh, it could be that you're measuring congestion across the entire path also, uh, which is fine, but you might not, you might uh, still want to be able to measure congestion within the SFC domain, even if you're not doing end-to-end uh, -end congestion. So uh, the idea is to use a couple of bits in the uh, NSH, doesn't matter which bits they are actually, uh, sort of nice if they're contiguous, but uh, the idea is that these are marked if there is zero clear, which is uh, you know, what you have uh, currently that indicates that there's the, uh, well, in general, when you're doing ECN, if the bits are clear, it indicates the transport is not ECN capable. Uh, and then uh, markings in those bits indicate uh, the that congestion has been experienced along the path. Well, actually, it's if it's, one bit indicates it's, whether it's capable or not, the other bit indi can indicate whether you've had indicated, you've received, indica uh, run into congestion. The, the drafts on, on uh, and the RFCs on ECN explain how to encode things in those bits. So uh, that's downstream. Upstream IP fix, there's a, a draft uh, in the TSV working group on tunnel congestion feedback. And it provides a mechanism for communicating uh, communication statistics uh, about how much ECN marking and maybe drop packets and things you've encountered. Uh, and you can deduce from those statistics what congestion there is. And these uh, statistics are cumulative so that if there are occasional dropped uh, packets in this upstream flow, it's not a problem. Uh, the recommended uh, transport is uh, <coughs> SCCB so you can have uh, a you know a less blocking and even if the uh, transmission is somewhat less reliable and can drop packets. So one question, what could the classifier do that would actually improve the, your congestion situation? Now, this is doesn't claim to be a complete list, but it can it can throttle traffic. Possibly the uh, ingressor classifier knows something about the further sources, uh, and it can send uh, further congestion feedback messages of some sort further upstream to do something. And, and possibly it could use this to make some decision about how it classifies things. And of course, as, as soon as I say that, everybody is talking about f routes flipping back and forth. I'm not talking about trying to instantaneously go for less uh, congested routes, but rather sort of a longer term thing where perhaps you have long lived uh, user sessions or customer sessions and uh, these periodically start up and terminate. If you have a new customer session coming along, it's going to last for a while. You know, that sort of thing, it would be reasonable to uh, take some account of how congested things currently appear to be uh, when you figure out what paths, assuming you have, of course, redundant paths that can offer the same sets of services. Um, one thing, it, there's a bunch of details about how ECN works. And uh, in generally, the way uh, ECN works, if you have a, a, a path, you want to do ECN over that path, say, between two SFFs or something like that, uh, you need to know whether the end of that path can properly uh, decapsulate and uh, take into account any ECN marking of congestion in the outer transport header. Because if it can't, uh, then you're basically making things worse by uh, assuming ECN marking along that path. 
uh, just to sort of give an example here, they, this is uh, talking about a, a path, a sort of one NSH hop, so to speak, from a SFF to an SFF or an SF. And assuming you have any nodes in the middle, which might have congestion, then if everything is supporting ECN, you, you basically copy the ECN bits <clears throat> from the NSH to the outer transport at the beginning, and you combine those bits according to the ECN rules at the end. And the lower one, if you do not have an ECN-aware uh, decapsulation at the end, uh, then you need to have any congestion marked by dropping. Because if you, and you don't want to mark the, the outer transport to indicate that it's ECN capable. Because if you do that, uh, and then the transit node indicates congestion by ECN marking, that indication will be thrown away at the, your uh, ECN non-aware decapsulator at the end. Uh, there was some comments on the list about, uh, let's see, about uh, whether this could be done in the transport header. Um, I, I, this draft recommends, of course, doing it in the NSH, because my feeling is if you try to do this entirely in the outer transport header, you're sort of riding on the froth above this, and you have to assume that everything along the way, including any IP or label routers or whatever, label switching routers, and everything all faithfully forwards and takes care of this uh, ECN information, um, even though it presumably at the boxes along the way, it logically discards the outer transport header uh, on input and then adds a new outer transport header. Uh, and it seems like a very non-robust, fragile way to do it. On the other hand, trying to mark it in the inner payload transport header is, uh, will only work if you are also doing uh, complete end-to-end -end congestion control and the original sender is marking it as ECN capable. If that's not true, then you have uh, the, the other problems. So um, there, because of this, you do need to add a bit of the configuration. So when you come in and you're looking at the path and the index, figure out where to go, you need one bit to indicate whether or not that hop, that uh, index hop, is going to be ECN capable or not. So uh, I guess... And anyway, this, this all will work better if you have ECN implemented everywhere, big surprise. You do have to have ECN at the, all the ingress and egress nodes, but you can incrementally deploy it in the middle. Um, ideally, you want ECN de uh, deployed every place where there's a bottleneck, uh, a queue somewhere that there might be uh, packet loss. Question? Come in, more. So, uh, with regards to upstream part, I think it would really benefit from decoupling from IP fix. We see a variety of streaming telemetry protocols rising right now. Okay. I think the solution would benefit from being decoupled from IP fix specifics and being able to kind of provide this information upstream independently of what's available. Okay, I think that's probably reasonable. Uh, really, the the mechanisms are, are quite independent uh, as long as you're, uh, you're collecting the, the congestion on the way down. Any way you can get it back to the classifier so that it can make use of that information uh, it should work. So, sure. I mean, yeah. in, in current form, it, it is bound semantically to IP fix, and I think it's... Mm -hmm. Well, it seems useful to have a, a, a standard or recommended mechanism, uh, but uh, other... Other things will work. Not everyone supports IP fix. Uh, and again, there are much better techniques to provide. Okay, well, if there's better techniques, then that's even, that's great. <laughs> uh, I we appreciate comments on the draft. Uh, Greg, uh, uh, list personal. Greg, you have a question? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so uh, ECN, uh, as I understand, provides us only indication of congestion. It doesn't quantify uh, that. Um, so would you? think that um, doing the measurement uh, and then exporting with a certain threshold uh, the results of the measurement uh, on path uh, would be uh, more informative of the condition in the network. Well, uh, ECN is somewhat probabilistic, and so you can determine the amount of congestion by observing the relative frequency of the different ECN uh, congestion uh, codes at the destination at the, when you're, you're measuring this. Yeah, because uh, we, we have uh, individual draft on application of uh, alternate marking method uh, in um, SFC-MSH, 
So that allows to come uh, to measure on each node uh, cumulative uh, packet delay delay variation, packet loss, uh, and uh, residential time. So uh, this uh, metrics, uh, and then again, you don't need to export each and every measurement. Uh, these measurements uh, can be uh, accumulated and exported uh, periodically over. Uh, course of uh, either time interval or number of packets uh, uh, measured. Sure. Well, this, this uh, sends uh, statistics upstream. And although this is written from the point of view of that, those statistics coming from the egress to the ingress, uh, the, the, if you see what the changes in ECN across any sub-interval inside, including like an SFF, monitoring the uh, ECN marking changes through a uh, ECN enabled uh, service function or whatever, you can certainly get other measurements internal to the uh, SFC domain. It seemed like the most common application would be this sort of overall uh, consideration, but others can be supported by the same ECN mechanism. So Stuart Bryant, so I think there's been some valid points made here. I mean, I remember Yakov Stein was always explaining to me that uh, looking at delay variation was a really good uh, precursor indication to, um, to, uh, to congestion. And given that we've got more powerful telemetry mechanisms, we're not trying to get it all down into one bit stolen from the packet. I think it's worth looking at some of these because I think we could do better than uh, ECN. And that will be a really positive thing to do. Sure. Uh, I, I believe the, the hope is, that at least with the L4S and some of the more advanced ECN uh, methodologies, that uh, trying to look at the, the delay shouldn't be very useful because there should be very little because it's uh, doing active queue management, management to solve your congestion problem. <laughs> uh, so you have to allow it to be congested enough to get delays to use delay to measure congestion. Um, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, clearly, if you can stay out of congestion, then you're probably not going to measure anything. But um, um, I think we should look at look at taking advantage of the more sophisticated telemetry and see if it helps any more than just the, using the one bit mechanism. Okay, well, it's two bits, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, I, I just want to uh, yeah thank you, uh, Stuart. That uh, uh, it's it's a very uh, good observation, and I agree that. Uh, jitter delay variation uh, indication of uh, in inconsistency in the queuing. Tom. Tom is Rahim Arvel. So just to clarify, uh, in the typical use case, do you see the uh, uh, congestion and notification being updated by SFFs and the reaction point is the classifier? Yes, that, I think that would be a typical application. Uh, Thanks. Okay, thanks, Donald. Okay. Okay, I guess I'm up now. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so uh, this draft was uh, already presented uh, Monday uh, to RTG group uh, and yesterday and we are three. So if you uh, heard it two times, so I apologize for the third uh, presentation. Uh, hope that maybe we'll have some questions uh, this time. Uh, next slide, please. So what was the problem? Uh, we discussed uh, identification of OEM um, in different uh, groups, and I decided to take a, a look and compare, uh, compare definition of OEM identification in uh, new protocols. And so how can we achieve to unambiguously identify OEM uh, command and data? being present in the packet. Uh, so we have, um, I, I put two um, OEM methods uh, in the scope. Uh, the case for the active OEM that uses specifically constructed uh, packets and that used for fault management and performance monitoring, which are F and P in F, F caps. 
Uh, it could be different uh, methods, single and dual and two way, one way. But important thing is that active OEM can be used um, uh, for the service activation. So it generates synthetic traffic and it could be a variated packet length, uh, inter-packet interval to generate different uh, patterns. A hybrid OEM uh, being um, defined by RFC 7799 as a combination of active and passive uh, methods. Um, so the active method is that when there is some impact on the network, either as a packet or changes to the data packet, and passive is that uh, methods that are doing observation. Uh, we have, um, at least I'm aware at ITF, of three uh, hybrid OEM methods that are um, alternate marking method. It triggers measurement. Uh, in situ OEM combines triggering the measurement and collecting and transporting measurement results or network or and network state information, which is a telemetry information uh, referred to in the packet itself, and hybrid two-step method, which is a method to collect and transport telemetry information on path in a um, generated follow-up packet. Uh, which protocols are, are looked at? Um, so I separate uh, classify them in two groups encapsulations that support optional metadata, uh, variable size headers, these are Geneve, SFC, and SH, GUI, and encapsulations that don't support uh, optional metadata, and thus I uh, refer to them as a fixed size headers. These are VIR and VXLAN GPE. Next slide, please. Uh, in Geneve, um, so OBIT, identifies that presence of OEM packet and gives us uh, explanation what happens with that, but does not define what OEM packet is. Uh, in GUI, the mechanism is different. The GUI uses a C bit to indicate whether um, protocol command field, uh, interpretation of the protocol command field. So if C bit is set, then this field uh, creates a new namespace and intended to be used among other uh, protocols by OEM. Um, I want to note that if the idea is that CBIT uh, means that this packet is uh, punted to control plane, may not necessarily well work with the uh, OEM methods that are implemented in a data plane. Uh, and especially in some cases with a hardware assist, because uh, things like BFD and performance uh, measurement uh, protocols, uh, they are more efficient if they are very close uh, to their fast path uh, and uh, benefit from hardware assist. But this is a side note. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, SFC and SH and OEM. So, as we already mentioned earlier, uh, so the um, 8300 only defines that OBIT indicates OEM packet. Uh, OEM framework uh, is a little bit more extensive, and it says that it indicates OEM packet, but not the function. Uh, IOM NSH. Uh, extends some in uh, regard to IOM, but again, it does not address uh, active OEM case. Next slide. For the fixed size, we have uh, BEER uh, RFC 8296, uh, and BEER took approach, uh, I believe, uh, very pragmatic. It uses next protocol field, and the OEM uh, protocol uh, is recorded in IANA registry. VXLAN GP, even though this does not support um, metadata, uses OEM flag bit. At the same time, it does have uh, next protocol field. Uh, next slide. So 
in cases where we have O bit or OEM bit and next protocol, uh, I see that there is a, a issue with the uh, dual OEM uh, identification. Uh, again, uh, I couldn't find the very strict definition of OEM packet in all these specifications. So what OEM packet is? Uh, and that is especially important for um, applications um, that allow metadata. So is it OEM commands and information uh, in header as metadata or OEM commands and information that immediately follow the header? Um, RFC 8393, um, which um, uh, specifies uh, use of next protocol none for SFC and SH, uh, suggested th that um, if all bits set and the next uh, protocol value is none, then that can be used as active OEM, uh, which I absolutely agree with. Uh, the only problem would be is that um, length of uh, metadata in uh, NSH is limited to 512 uh, octets, and in Geneva it's even uh, more limited if we extend this notion of non-protocol into Geneva encapsulation, it's 128 bytes. So that will uh, limit the uh, use, uh, usability of this uh, approach for active OEM uh, as a synthetic tra uh, traffic generator because we can be able only to generate packets up to that length. And again, um, so uh, how we identify uh, that uh, OEM command or information uh, follows the header, which is the most uh, case, um, usual case for um, generating uh, OEM uh, test packets for active OEM. Next slide, please. Um, so for all of that, I would consider um, following the recommendation. Uh, the O bit uh, indicates the presence of OEM commanded data in uh, the metadata. And uh, OEM commands the data that follow uh, the header indicated through the uh, dedicated value of the next protocol field. Um, okay, we can go next slide. Uh, there is some uh, discussion of um, in caps, uh, OEM uh, in case over MPLS uh, data plane um, so that uh, we need to identify the source ID because uh, if we're not using IP UDP encapsulation of OEM packet but use it as more like ACH or non-IP encapsulation, then we need to uh, communicate uh, the source ID. Uh, next slide. Uh, so it's to on path uh, OEM, uh, which is um, whether it's alternate marking method in situ or hybrid to step. And the next slide is the, the finalizing slide. So uh, there is some work that uh, I'll be uh, uh, doing with this draft uh, to update it on the GUI because uh, current uh, content uh, uh, is not accurate and I appreciate Tom's uh, comment and explanation of uh, how GUI plans to do OEM. Uh, I welcome comments and uh, in terms of the life um, of this draft, I see it as a uh, to generate a discussion uh, to be used to uh, reflect the discussion, but not necessarily uh, being something that we'll publish at the end, but that can be revisited. So, questions? No one is at the mic, Greg. Okay, we're going to move on to the next presentation. Right, Thank you very much for making the time to do this and for doing the work in producing the draft. Okay, take it to the list. And uh, actually, uh, at the meeting at uh, RTGVG, since this is a group that uh, kind of 
uh, adapted it for time being, uh, please include RPGVG uh, and NVO3 uh, lists uh, in your questions and comments. Name-based. Hello, everybody. So uh, I'm uh, Devashish uh, Prakasta, and I'll be presenting on behalf of the co-authors, especially uh, Dirk was supposed to present, and he's unable to be here today. So, um, so uh, this is basically um, in an earlier draft, uh, which is mentioned there, a new service function called SRR was uh, described, and it's, it was um, uh, the function was to handle uh, dynamic chaining, and at the, at the level of uh, named uh, transactions. And uh, in that function, forwarding decisions were made when a service request is received uh, using name-based identification of service endpoints. Now, in the previous meeting, uh, we received uh, feedback to consider these function as uh, to be integrated within the SFF or uh, maybe an extension to SFF uh, rather than exposing explicit uh, service functions. So with that, uh, in this draft, we defined uh, ways to integrate the SRR function into the SFF. And uh, we wanted to extend three main SFC concepts. One is this extending the service function path to include name-based interactions. We define something called NSFP. Then the second one is extend network locator map to include name-based next hop, which is def the definition of NNLM and extend service function forwarder to act on such name-based information, and it is defined as NSFF operation. And with that, we, uh, we kept, wanted to keep it as a backward compatible to the current SFC architecture. That means no changes to the functionalities of uh, SFC nodes and NSH uh, protocol. So the first uh, uh, extension is this name-based service function path. So the realization of this name-based service function path is through, extend, uh, through the extended SFF operations is kind of illustrated in the draft using HTTP transactions, where URIs are being used to name a service function along the NSFP. And uh, uh, this operation is not just restricted to HTTP as the protocol or the URI. Uh, we can also, it can be extended to other identifiers as well, uh, such as IP address can be used as a name to identify uh, the uh, ser serving node. And um, <clears throat> it basically uh, says that any identifier can be used and are interpreted as name in this NSFP. The second uh, extension is in the network locator map and it's called name-based network locator map. And this, uh, this map is extended with the ability to consider name relations Again, since we use HTTP as an example, URIs are used there as, a, as well as any high-level transport protocol such as HTTP uh, for uh, packet forwarding. And uh, the third extension is about the whole operation or the name-based service function uh, forwarder is illustrated in this picture here. So this shows how uh, the, um, um, the, the packets that are basically handled so for example, uh, the first step shows that the packet comes from a classifier to NSFF1, which process the NSH header to identify the next SF by mapping the NSH information to appropriate entry in the name-based locator map. And it identifies in the name-based locator map as identified with the name as foo.com, and then it forwards to SF1. And then uh, the service function one processes that and sends it back to NSFF one again. And then uh, it retrieves the next up information from the same network locator map and sees that it's a foo2.com. 
But since uh, the service function is not being locally uh, available, so NSF on consults the name resolver to determine the suitable uh, forwarding information and forward this to the next NSFF, which is the NSFF2. So the packet from NSFF1 at NSFF2, which is processed in a very similar way, and it basically processes the NSH header to identify the next SF um, uh, mapping and identifies that it's a foo2.com, which eventually identifies it's a local function and forwards it to the service function too. So, so I think uh, those are the three extensions that are uh, uh, described as part of this name-based service function forwarder. So um, as a next step, we are again want to hear from the working group about uh, the kind of the validity of this extension or is this um, the, or is it in the scope of the service function working group? We also mentioned earlier that we have implemented the first version of this solution in H2020 projects, Point and Rife. And we are working to align this solution also with this draft, which is basically uh, putting the functionality in the service function forwarder. Uh, that's it uh, for the presentation part. Hello, Evangelos Halopidis, uh, Mojadat Networks. So just a clarification question. Is this tied any, any way to ICN kind of networks? Or is it going to be used there as well? Not really, because it, we are just handling it as the name-based identification of the endpoints. So we didn't think about that. Developers. Just a question when you mention is just to be sure that I have a uh, got your rights. It's about when you mentioned that the URI is just an example. This on the uh, resolution doesn't imply any kind of DNS uh, uh, resolution on the uh, on the URIs if the URIs are used. Uh, can you, I, I like? Uh, you, did you uh, say is DNS being used? Is that what you're yeah, asking? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you you are you are you're using URIs or URLs as a, as a example or references. For names, I assume that from what you have said, you are not, uh, DNS is not used to. Uh, so in the draft, if you see, uh, we have mentioned the different ways to, uh, we can implement. DNS is a way, but there is, there are some problems with DNS. So we uh, defined another way of solving the, solving the, resolving the URIs. So, so I'm, I'm not read the draft. In yeah, the in the draft, we have mentioned the different ways to do that. It's about the, the DNS is based on A records? I hope not. Yeah, pardon? Uh, at the uh, DNS resolution based in A records, in address is, uh, records. Yeah, so it's one of the way we can use the DNS resolver. Yeah, it is mentioned, described there. Yeah. Okay. So I want to mention a couple of points. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, you were... You no, were no, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned that that could probably would break the idea of the having the overlay completely independent from the underlay. Wouldn't it? Um, I, if, I, I'm not clearly following the question. Maybe if, if you're resolving the DNS, you're using the DNS to resolve the so how the next hop. Mm -hmm. you, you're not uh, taking the decision at the um, service function level, and not on the. Uh, it's not a matter for the classifier. So you are you are jumping jumping from a different. Uh, positions in the underlay. Yeah, it's, so that is one of the problem. So that's the problem. Basically, we basically say the DNS is the, not the preferred way to do it. I'm just going to run through a number of issues that I had asked you to address in your presentation when we discussed this that I do not see in here so that the working group can keep those in mind in considering what they want to do with this, if anything. Um, having name lookups in packet fast path processing is problematic for most of the use cases SFC is interested in. The dynamics, you specifically say that the whole point of this is to be able to support things which move around where instances are created and deleted. So you need to, that means that caching is of limited applicability and that further impacts the, the data plane effect. Most having tunnels that require TCP setup is interesting. Having tunnels that require TCP setup per packet is very interesting. And so, there's a lot of issues here with the way you've done things that make this, sure, updating the table structure so it can allow a name and allow HTTP to be specified would be easy, but that has a lot of implications on service function forwarders and on their performance and behavior. And so I think it's much more complicated than you paint.
Any other uh, questions or comments? Uh, I've got someone Thank at the, you. Uh, Danny at the mic. <laughs> you have a question. Uh, Danny at the mic. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Oh, I see. Sorry. I, I thought you had a question. Uh, okay. Oh, thank you. Apologies. Yep. Okay, go ahead, Danny. Thank you. Hello, everybody. This is Danny Latros Perez. And on behalf of the all the listed authors, I am presenting this document. Next slide, please. So this presentation is about a new world that provides initial arguments why ALTO, application layer traffic optimization, is a mainful protocol in the context of serving fusion chain it travels in different domain. And it focuses on how the ALTO protocol be used to advertise and discover a strat, topology, resource, and service information from different domains and then compute inter-domain service function part. And the overall objective of this document is to start a discussion between the service function chain and the ALTO working group and others working group are welcome, concerning if, how, and under which condition ALTO will be useful to improve the multi-domain service function chain process. Next, please. Danny, before you continue, I just want to make clear to everybody in the room and anybody else listening, Currently, multi-domain support is outside of scope for the working group, and control plane support is outside of the scope for the working group. We'll let you present, because it's still, we have enough time, I'd like to see your yeah. material, but people need to be aware, while interesting, this is outside of scope. Okay, hey, hey, I know. Hey. Hey, I can continue. Wait, sorry. I can continue or? Yes, yes continue. Ah, okay, so, sorry. <laughs> uh, so in order to offer service across all the kind of boundaries, the multi-domain approach involves two aspects, multi-domain between a single operator and multi-operator co collaboration. Eh? So Slow maybe... down. Slow okay. down. <laughs> the the okay. audio is making that, is <laughs> a little bit of problems with the audio, <laughs> made that completely inaudible. <laughs> sorry, okay. slow down. No, it's okay. Market fragmentation results from having a different operators focused to a specific region. And the technology fragmentation represents a bottleneck internally for an operator. In addition to technology domain, there are other reasons for having different domains between an operator, such as different geographies, different performance characteristics, scalability, policy, etc. Next slide, please. So in this context, a uh, multi-domain service function chain refers to the ability to deploy service function chains across multiple domains. And this domain's division depends on circumstances such as geolocation, technology, administration, as I mentioned in the before slide. And to do so, an inter-domain communication process between different domains is necessary in order to exchange topology, resource, and service information, and then compute inter-domain service function but next slide, please. So nowadays, different standardization activities and research projects have been focusing on multi-domain network, network service chaining. For example, the hierarchical service function chaining processes a hierarchical service function chaining for multi-domain and the same administration entity. Another document, the hybrid hierarchical multi-domain service function chaining describes a service function chaining crossing different domains owned by various organizations. And in the network function virtualization research group, the draft multi-domain network virtualization envision a complete end to end logical network as in teaching services offered, offered by multiple domain from multiple providers. And another initiative is, for example, this exit report that describes different NFB manual architectural approach with use cases related to network services provider using multiple administrative domain. Next slide, please. In case of the research group, the research project, several architectural models are integrating NFB management and SDN control capabilities to address the challenges towards flexibility and on-demand service chaining. For example, the 5GX and the 5GX transformer projects are integrating multiple administrative domains and technologies through the collaboration between operators in the context of 5G networks. Next slide, please. 
So it can be seen that a dialogue between potential domains could be beneficial from more effective use of resources and services and increasing the multi-domain series function chain performance. So the Alto protocol provides abstract network information in form of map services that can be consumed by application in order to become network aware and take optimizing decisions regarding traffic flows. Recently, for example, the Alto Working Group is discussing the use of the Alto as an information model for representing network resources and service in multi-domain scenarios. For example, the broker assistant architecture proposed a broker plane working as a coordinator between a set of top-level control plane for multi-domain orchestration in 5G networks. And the Unicode draft present resource orchestration framework, a resource orchestration framework for multi-domain geodistributed data analytics. Both proposal resource in Alto as an information model to support resource service and topology discovery across different domains. And Alto and Futures Alto base extension can be used to, to offer, for example, an Alto property map service to get a clear global view of other potential candidate domains and an Alto cost map services to compute interdomain service function paths. Next slide, please. As a motivating use case, we are using a proposed architecture in the Hubble hierarchical multi-domain service function chain document. This architecture uses a service function chain exchange platform to release interdomain communication between top-level control planes. So in a, in a high level, the scope of the service function chain exchange platform contains two, two tags, provide end to end visibility, uh, information from different domains and compute inter-domain service function paths to select service function location from multiple candidate domains. In this context, the service function chain exchange platform can take advantage of the Alto services to obtain inter-domain information to guide the selection process so that the best domain or candidate domain can be selected. Next slide, please. So the hybrid hierarchical service function chain combines distributed and centralized control plane. Um, in our use cases, scenario is based on the centralized approach. This means that multiple service function chain domain connected are connected in a logical service function chain exchange platform, as shown in the figure on the, on the left. And in the figure on the right, we are including an Alto server component to, pro to provide abstract map services. Next slide, please. Uh, so here we have a specific example. Figure on the left shows a service function exchange platform connecting three different domains, AS1, AS2, AS3. Each, pro each domain provides different service function. Servi for example, AS1, service function 1, AS2, service function 2, 3, AS3, service function 3. Each high level control playing in each domain can provide inter-domain information. From this information, the service function chain exchange platform creates a hierarchical database containing inter-domain information. This information source is used by the Alto server to create different Alto, Alto map services. For example, the property map in figure on the right includes a property value grouped by autonomous system, for example. This value contains supported network function However, additional properties could be considered, such as network function types, resource availability, CPU, memory storage, et cetera. And an Alto server can also provide uh, code maps. In this case, the Alto code map defines a patch vector as an array of autonomous system representing the AES level topological distance for a given service function chain request. The requests in this example go from service function one to service function two to service function three. And the interdomain service function path response contain a list of potential domains to be traversed to deliver such services. In this case, we obtain two different service function paths. Next slide, please. So from initial discussions and review, we identified some questions and issues that need further discussion. For example, as, as they, uh, I was mentioned before, the current service function chain working group is the scope is to one single administrative domain, even for the hierarchical service function check that the assumption is the is that subdomains are managed by the same administrative entity. So before going into the protocol detail regarding how the release the interdomain service changing, the idea is to describe con concrete use samples with required service function from different administrative domains 
and start the requirement and justification for such needs. And another point is to go over the security and privacy consideration. Next slide, please. And that's it. Basically, as next step, uh, the request is for the working group to provide a feedback. We got a review from Mohamed Boukadir, and we will address the comments in the next version. Do you have any comments of this that will be very appreciated, or you can do that on, on the mailing list? Thanks. Uh, this is Dhruv from Huawei. Uh, without commenting on the rest of the presentation, I just wanted to give an input that there is uh, some work in T's which is called SF aware topologies, which exposes both the topology as well as SF information via the Yang models. So you can also see like compare between whether the Alto extensions is giving you a better approach or using a Yang model to expose the information from domain to the exchange thing that you have on the top. Just a input for something further to analyze. Thank you. Yeah, so yet in order to create or the abstract maps, we need a resource, uh, an information source. This the, in the Alto working group, the this information source can be provided from different uh, res, resources and formats. It's, it's, it's not not uh, it's not some specific form. I don't know if. I can respond to your question, or we can discuss a little bit in more details in the, on the mailing list. Okay. So, yeah. this is interesting. While our charter isn't as clear as it used to be, Jim just went and looked. The NSH was approved very specifically on single domain. So you, I appreciate particularly, Danny, you're raising, before we do work on multi-domain, here are the questions. It would, I'm not sure where in the IETF to entertain those questions, but they are very good questions, and it would be interesting to see them discussed further. If people have thoughts, talk to Danny by email or send them to the list as a whole. We don't slap people for sending things that are interesting, but only on the edge of our work to the list. We'd love to see more engagement on the list, frankly. The other thing is I can see one of the blue sheets. I don't see the other one. So wherever it is, it needs to come forward. Oh, OK, there it is. Thank you. But thank you thank very you. much, Danny. There's thank nobody you. at the microphone. That's why. That's a wrap. And with that, we have completed our agenda. So thank you very much, folks. <laughs> yeah, Eric signed the other one as the last person. <laughs>